line. And I said, you know, this doesn't really say much specific about what I'm going to do. But what I'm really going to try to do is to give you a, an overview of our approach to cancer biology. I'm a basic immunologist, but about 10 years ago, I made what I consider one of my best decisions to enter the field uh, of immunology, or of, of uh, cancer biology. At that time, <clears throat> uh, we boldly want, went into studies of the APC min mouse. And <clears throat> this is a picture which sort of, in many ways, reminds me of this project, that this was taken about six and a half years ago. This is the summit from the summit of Mont Blanc. Um, and <clears throat> there, it was shrouded in this lenticular cloud. And we could see, <clears throat> see if this is working. You can see <clears throat> down to the left is Chamonix, and over to the right is Italy. But <clears throat> we can only get a hint of what's going on. Over the next four or five hours, these clouds were burned off, and we could see with great clarity what was below. And that is just like this project. In about 2010, we our first publication, and it gave us a hint of what was going on uh, with the um, Wnt signaling in this colon cancer model. And <clears throat> over the next five, six years, it has turned into what I consider a really remarkable story. So <clears throat> I'm going to give you an overview of what we've done. Um, and it may be a little bit disjointed because of the time limitations. I'm <clears throat> just going to talk to you about the salient points and the, the, the logic behind how we're approaching analyzing the immune system. I assume that everybody in this room is so as familiar okay. with all of the immunotherapeutic strategies that have been so successful. It's from somewhere else. They largely target activation okay, of stages with oh, checkpoint I mean, blockade. Oh, like, here. For oh. the most part, we are avoiding that, and I'll explain that in a minute in more detail. Um, we want to find out what combination therapies might be applied together with those to make it truly more um, successful and to explore other aspects of how the immune system recognizes tumors. Most of what I'll tell you today has to deal with the intestinal tumor genesis in the APC min model <clears throat> uh, from several different uh, cell types. At the beginning, we had, uh, fairly soon, we identified the Wnt antagonist DKK1 <clears throat> um, and, and have studied it in some detail. We have shown that it is critical for the function of regulatory T cells. We've also then explored how it affects natural killer cells. <clears throat> this is a, um, affects the myeloid derived suppressor cells. And I, this is a very complex cell type or multiple cell types. And um, that then. <clears throat> um, we continued these studies then in a homolog of DKK1 that is DKK2, and we're now getting into the mechanisms as how that affects stem cell differentiation and proliferation in the gut. For the last um, five years or so, we have been deriving in various tumor models um, human uh, tumor-derived patient genographs, and so I'll give you a summary of that at, at the end. So <clears throat> besides the fact that there are about 1,000 clinical trials at any given point in time studying checkpoint blockade, we actually thought that this was, in fact, it's not that we're not interested in it. We are, were, in fact, considered that a very fundamental aspect of immune recognition that we needed to study. And so <clears throat> about 25 years ago, we put a serious effort to understand how CD8 T cells and CD4 cells recognize the peptide MHC ligand. Uh, and we, we <clears throat> made soluble T cell receptors. We had peptides and soluble class 1 to study at a very 
pure level how these molecules interact. Right. And we published really what is kind of a landmark paper in which we showed the properties of the T cell receptor interacting with MHC. And we had well over 50 mutant peptides of a given class one peptide. And so we had a detailed understanding of how individual sequence variation affected the recognition by the T cell receptor. We then followed that up with a study. <clears throat> this was, we began these studies really about as soon as you could clone and, and work with the T cell receptors. There was a, a CD8 cell that was uh, derived at MIT in Herman Eisen's lab, and we studied that functionally. And <clears throat> we then showed that, in fact, mutant peptides which had no ability to bind or to be recognized by the T cell receptors were perfectly functional in an in, in vitro assay. So <clears throat> the answer was that the CD8 co-receptor could actually make the peptides recognized. So the individual numbers or the affinities are not so important. It's really whether something is new and can be recognized. And I don't care what algorithms you apply, you really can't predict all of the possibilities. You can make some guesses, and you need to show what peptides are functional. So we had a, a commitment to doing this. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, generated the, let me see if I can make this work. Oh, yeah. So <clears throat> this graduate student made the T cell receptors. Um, we, had, we had several things in place that allowed us to make the soluble T cell receptors. That as we had discovered here, the LY6 multigene family, <clears throat> this is about 20 hematopoietic differentiation uh, antigens. The first one happened to be SCA1, or the stem cell antigen 1. Um, another one was LY6C. And these are now the best antigens for defining, for instance, the MDSC populations. <clears throat> the homolog, the closest homolog of the LY6C gene was actually the CD59, the human CD59 gene, which as you probably know is a complement inhibitory protein. And that, uh, together with my collaborator Peter Sims at the time, we <clears throat> developed a patent position, was really uh, the foundation of Alexion Pharmaceuticals. But that was really, <clears throat> all of these papers then represented kind of the, the uh, a watershed moment in, in our scientific development. Because once we had, <clears throat> once we had uh, now an excuse to study human immunology, and when Jordan Pober came back to Yale, he and I have then collaborated for the last 20 some years on human immunology, studying human T cells, and developing in vivo models of humanized mice. For many years, we've studied vascular biology problems um, and how T cells interact with endothelium uh, in, in uh, transplant and inflammatory situations. A little later, we worked with um, Kevin Harold and Nancy Ruddle. But we developed what I think is really the only credible model, uh, humanized model of um, the early phase of type 1 diabetes, that is insulitis. <clears throat> and then more recently, we've turned to um, humanized uh, mouse models of cancer. So what I'm mainly going to tell you today is <clears throat> the data that I will show you has to do with the intestinal cancer. Um, and <clears throat> this then shows that the, the stem cells uh, are at the base of the crypt. The entire epithelial layers are, is one of the most rapidly dividing cell populations in the body. Uh, and because of that, it's probably more prone and then amenable to analysis of the process of tumorigenesis. So uh, this is tightly controlled by the Wnt system. It controls differentiation of the cell types, <clears throat> and, and it is remarkably regulated. But um, so what we really want to do is to understand how um, exactly how this process is, is normally regulated and how it is dysregulated when you have mutations in the APC gene. 
let's see here. So a normal <coughs> progression of CRC is that there are, <coughs> there's normal epithelium. Initially, there are uh, adenomas uh, which grow, and they can become then uh, carcinomas. And in, the pr in this process, in, in most CRC patients, there's mutation of the APC gene. Later on, there's mutation of KRAS and TP53 uh, and, and additional genes. At the end, uh, <clears throat> I will uh, hope to convince you that some of the molecules that we're studying now may contribute to the process of metastasis because that's actually our next target. I'll just say a couple words about <clears throat> Wnt signaling. Wnt <clears throat> agonists, there are about 19 Wnt agonists that are expressed everywhere. There are about four ones in the DKK family, which are uh, the DKK1 is the highest affinity Wnt antagonist, and so we'll talk about uh, those. But <clears throat> Wnt ligands can bind to these receptors and ultimately result in <clears throat> activation by putting beta catenin in the uh, nucleus. So it's a transcriptional activation mechanism. On the right, <clears throat> you can see that DKK interacts with LRP5 and LRP6 primarily. There's a crystal structure of LRP6 interacting with, um, with DKK. And it's then a competitive inhibitor um, in the canonical pathway. But what I'm going to tell you about today is that the DKK is primarily operating by non-canonical pathways. That means it's totally novel and there are new transcriptional pathways that are involved. And so there, uh, there's a lot of new information here. So <clears throat> we chose APC min um, for a variety of reasons. Um, I, when I was a graduate student, I met uh, Adrian Bird and uh, Liz Blackburn as postdocs in Joe Gall's lab, and I was very impressed with them and how they ultimately became involved in cancer biology. <clears throat> Adrian crossed uh, MBD4, which is a DNA glycosylase, to APC min and found a vast increase in colon polyps. Other investigators have crossed a variety of other DNA repair enzymes or methylases. DNMT1, for instance, has a very complicated relationship, but there was a reduction in the polyps that are present <coughs> in the APC in mice. So this seemed to me <coughs> a developmental system where we can characterize the earliest stages of tumor genesis. <coughs> so in this mouse strain, and so we're talking here, I'll just emphasize that this is a single point mutation at codon 850 in the APC gene, which cuts off the C-terminal two-thirds of the protein. And it has a really remarkable phenotype. A Japanese group characterized the earliest polyps that you can detect at three weeks, and when these are microdissected and analyzed by PCR, you can see LOH at three weeks. We typically look at 16 to 20 weeks when the polyps are much expanded and we can quantitate them much more readily and we can analyze them in molecular ways. So my goal here was as a mechanism to understand how inflammation can drive genetic instability. Um, so that's why we chose it. It's also a great model for human FAP disease, which is mutations in the same uh, gene. So <clears throat> we wanted to pick a cytokine that was the most, one of the most aggressive ones about 10 years ago that we knew about, and that was IL-17A. If we crossed IL-17A to APC min, we found a dramatic reduction in the level of polyps, about a 90% reduction in the small intestine polyps or in the large intestine polyps, um, <clears throat> both in terms of numbers and also size. So this was a very strong phenotype that we were ex very excited about. And so <clears throat> this then led us to analyze at a much deeper level what we, we then knew that the Wnt agonists or antagonists 
were very important in this process, and we could connect them with cytokine regulation. So <clears throat> we then did RT-PCR for the vast majority of the Wnt agonists and antagonists on about every cell type we could isolate from mice. And so we came up with um, the observation that DKK1 was uniquely expressed in T-Rex, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. <clears throat> so we then cloned an overexpressed uh, DKK1 uh, and then utilized this to see what it did to immune lymphocytes. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> this, this is our, our protein. Our protein uh, gave us <clears throat> responses that were in the physiologic range. So we were studying <clears throat> both in mice and in humans the, uh, the function of DKK. In both mice and in humans, the level of, uh, in serum is about 3 nanograms per mil. <clears throat> so we found that our recombinant protein if we added it, this is the graphical abstract of an immunity paper, so I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to show you much of the paper, just the summary. If you add recombinant DKK to naive T cells by processes involving this Z signaling pathways, it was a very strong stimulator of type 2 immune responses. IL-4, 5, 10, 13, et cetera, uh, were <coughs> stimulated. <laughs> So we then, because of that, we then characterized some prototypic type 2 immune responses to see what we could learn. And so I'll term this environmental challenges at the moment, but much of what I can say you might consider substituting in tumor cells as opposed to environmental challenge. So here, this is a house dust mine and this is a lush mania. <laughs> The unique observation here was that <clears throat> these probably proteases on these uh, allergens or parasites interact with human platelets and cause activation of the human platelets. So <clears throat> that activation causes an upregulation of P-selectin and that then promotes its interaction with other cell types. So in the case, so P-selectin interacts with its ligand, PSGL1, and so you interact with a variety of cell types, and that causes then their uh, migration or infiltration into the target tissues. So in this case, in the asthma model into the lung, or in the uh, parasite infection in the cutaneous lesion. <clears throat> so these activated platelets uh, <clears throat> are really the primary site of uh, interaction. Uh, this involves a lot of different experimental models and people, and we are a very collaborative group. This particular paper had 19 Yale co-authors uh, from 10 different departments. I'll just show you very briefly in the top panel. <clears throat> this, if you activate CD4 cells and you add our recombinant cytokine at physiologic concentrations, this is a large amount of type 2 cytokines. And just so that you believe it, here shows <clears throat> you can sort these neutrophils and you can see the green platelets adhering to those neutrophils by amnes technology. If you just do H&E on the lung tissue, you can actually then see <clears throat> in a wild type mouse you can see these complexes that have uh, migrated, infiltrated into the lung, and these the little orange arrows show co-staining of platelets and T cells. There is a hypomorphic mouse strain for DKK, and if you lack DKK, then they're essentially resistant to asthma, um, and you don't see those complexes. You can do a certain, you can reconstruct a certain amount of this in, in vitro. That is, if you, if you deplete, if you deplete the platelets, um, then you see that you lose DKK. Uh, 
Um, if you have a soluble Lushmanian antigen extract and you expose it to human platelets in vitro, uh, you can cause the direct release of DKK1. Since I brought that up now, many of the assays that I'll show you in mice, we have also used human T cells, lymphocyte assays, and as far as we can tell, this is a highly conserved regulation system, and what's true for mice is true for humans. So uh, there is uh, an environmental challenge, and the initial interaction in this case uh, can be with platelets. You might think of the environmental challenge again as a tumor. Um, there are aggregates that form, and they can then infiltrate the tissue and lead to chronic inflammation. Alternatively, this can cause chronic uh, inflammation uh, on its own. And we, we now know a lot of the signaling pathways that are important for this process. <clears throat> okay, something that was no one would have expected, but from our RT-PCR analysis and some immunologic studies that I won't go into, we knew that regulatory T cells were important. So this just shows <clears throat> RT-PCR analysis of naive or effector T cells, various differentiated T cell subtypes, or various thymocyte populations. And really the only thing that was DKK1 positive was the thymic-derived regulatory T cells. So to study the, them functionally, one of the simplest things, again, having to do with our interest in mucosal immunology, was an inflammatory bowel disease model. So if you put T cells into a rag knockout mouse, the effector cells themselves will call in, cause inflammation in the gut. If you titrate in <clears throat> then regulatory T cells, they can inhibit that development of inflammation. And so <clears throat> here, uh, if you put in wild type regulatory T cells, uh, there is no weight loss in this mouse. But if you prepare regulatory T cells from this hypomorphic mouse strain, which has about a 95% reduction of DKK, they don't function in vivo. The bottom part is just the, the histological uh, scoring of the, uh, uh, the intestines. <clears throat> so if you took cells out of that in vivo setting, which is a lymphopenic mouse, <clears throat> we find um, that in fact, there's actually more DKK present on uh, the T cells than we could actually even get in vitro. If we then looked at those by immunofluorescence, we all of a sudden found that in fact, there is cell surface DKK on regulatory T cells. We knew the DKK sequences were there for about three years, but there was no good way to detect the protein until we finally found one antibody that allowed us to do that. So what I'm saying here is that it's critical for mouse function. It's going to be even more important in human Tregs. Human Tregs, by facts, look somewhat like that. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> DKK1 seems to affect most cell types. And so we then <clears throat> examined uh, its uh, role in the B16 melanoma model, where you inject about 200,000 cells in the tail vein and you look at lung metastasis. So <clears throat> this represents the red is DKK antibody treatment, or here is the hypomorphic mouse strain. And so in both of these situations, we had about a 50% reduction in lung mets if we block DKK with antibody, or we knock it down genetically. <clears throat> if you look at the, <clears throat> uh, at the lung, you find that, in fact, there are um, more CD45 cells, and there are more, uh, in fact, neutrophils. And the activation markers that are normally associated with neutrophils are reduced. That is C96 or LY49A, for instance. So. <clears throat> If you look at the lungs themselves, it's, they're pretty visually dramatic. That is, 
Here with the control immunoglobulin, there are a few um, lung mats. <clears throat> if you deplete the NK cells, all of a sudden you have many lung mats. You get about, in this case, about 200. Uh, <clears throat> so the cells you put in are able to go to the lung and form colonies. If you add in DKK1 antibody, <clears throat> so you clear it out, then you fully activate uh, the NK cells to kill the tumor. So <clears throat> it's, it's, a, it's an important negative regulator of NK cells. Uh, the NK cells in this model then are activated. These are activation markers that are all up. The other thing that appears to occur in this model, I'll go back, <clears throat> is that the NK cells, the DKK then is a homeostatic negative regular of NK cell function, and <clears throat> it is probably regulating how some NK cells can then differentiate into another lymphocyte uh, cell type, um, uh, ILC1 type cells. And so that's how it's probably negatively regulating uh, NK cell function. <clears throat> okay, I'll, I'll turn, I'm not watching the clock here, but I better hurry up. Um, <clears throat> I told you at the beginning that it activated type two immunity, and so that is regulated by um, STAT6. And so <clears throat> we crossed um, APC min mines with STAT6 knockouts, and you can see that there's a <clears throat> IL-4 is very important in APC min mice. There's a very dramatic drop in intestinal uh, polyps, <clears throat> uh, which is characterized there. The surprise was the effect on the myeloid-derived suppressor cell populations. That is, a normal mouse, these are the monocytic MDSCs, the PMN MC MDSCs, but the APC min mice had much higher levels of MDSCs <clears throat> of both of these populations, but also what we call IMDSCs or an intermediate population. This is really almost a black box, I think, at this point. There are at least three distinct populations here that we can isolate physically from a mouse. We're doing that and we're then transferring them into an MC38 uh, tumor transplant model. These have all distinct functions. <clears throat> The, the, here you can see these, the, our friends, the LY6 antigens, these are very potent suppressors in vitro of T cells. The surprise was that the intermediate MDSCs seem to stimulate tumor expansion when they're in vivo. So they're all a little different. There may be more subdivisions than that. We can take bone marrow from mice and we, we have conditions now to in vitro expand them so we can get more cells uh, more readily for further analysis. <clears throat> so there's a very dramatic phenotype of the type 2 driver uh, in uh, generating MDSCs. So how does that work? <clears throat> well, if you then look at these mice, you find that there's not much of an effect on CD4 cells. There's an expansion of CD8 cells, and they are interferon gamma positive they are positive for granzyme and perforin. And if you look at the tumors in vivo, you can see by tunnel staining that there is now an activation of cytolytic T cells that is killing off these tumors. So <clears throat> bear in mind, there's a single mutation for APC. And here we've knocked out STAT6. And we get this pretty strong, amazing phenotype. So I'll <clears throat> whiz through some work on DKK2. It's quite exciting, actually. We're trying to understand how stem cells and tumor cells may be regulated by the immune system or regulating themselves. So a standard model is AOM uh, DSS, in which you give a carcinogen and then three cycles of DSS water. <clears throat> and as others have shown, and in human cancer, there is an elevation of DKK2 as the cancer progresses. So how is that happening? If you look at the mice at the end of this model, you can see by immunostaining there is a higher level of DKK2. <clears throat> Here 
we then used villain Cree APC, or this is wild type mice, villain Cree DKK2 flocks um, uh, from Dan Wu <clears throat> and assayed the effect on the tumors. And we, we show, a, a, again, a pretty significant reduction uh, in the tumors in this model. And <clears throat> we notice, in fact, that it knocks out some of the stem cell proteins. If you take individual polyps and do um, quantitation, you, know, you find that over time there is an increase in the expression of DKK2, whereas the adjacent tissue is, uh, is much less. These kinds of polyps, we've now, and I'll, I'll just show you briefly in a second, are this, we've done a, a fair amount of R, uh, RNA-seq analysis on this. Um, we believe here that if you, if you purify the cells according to their stem cell loss, there's a correlation with DKK2. And so <clears throat> we now believe that, uh, here's the first slide where we're using intestinal organoids. You can take these uh, intestinal cells, chop them up, and under appropriate culture conditions, you can culture the stem cells. If you add recombinant DKK2, you can stimulate the transcription of DKK2. So it's a positive feedback uh, loop where the DKQ2 can drive uh, increased expression. So there's a quantitation on a time course. If you do that, <clears throat> now if we use it for maximum inducible um, LGR5, that's the stem cell uh, marker, driving uh, uh, deletion of DKK2, you can see that there is, uh, this is the wild type and the tumors that are formed, and there's a substantial reduction uh, here. So we believe, in fact, that it's the, the stem cells are the source of these tumors. <clears throat> As I've said, we've done considerable amount of uh, RNA-seq analysis. I don't really have time to show you that, but as we would have hoped, there was a decrease in EMT-related genes and stem cell marker expression when you knock out EDK2. Uh, this shows some of the, the RNA. Uh, this is just qRTPCR uh, RT -PCR analysis. <clears throat> you can take all of this RNA-seq analysis uh, that we have done and then put that into some IP, IPA software, which is Ingenuity um, uh, uh, Pathway Analysis. Thank you. <clears throat> the, the strongest candidate by about a thousand-fold was HNF4, and that is really a remarkable gene. And so <clears throat> we're now uh, headed in the direction to try to see how HNF4 may interact uh, with DKK2. <clears throat> this is just some of the, the IPA analysis showing that it, it seems to be a negative regular of LGR5, which is a stem cell marker, and other things are, are elevated. There was a remarkable paper that came out <clears throat> um, in eLife a little over a year ago, which characterizes how HNF4-alpha regulates ex its expression in the, in the stem cells as they expand in the gut. There are two different promoters and that, that encode differential uh, exon ones. And by antibody, you can see that uh, they're regulating either the crypt cells or the ones that are at the end of the villus. I'll hurry. These are organoids and uh, <clears throat> how they're... Um, can be stimulated with uh, recombinant DKK. So uh, to conclude this part, we, uh, we have some seriously new insights into how it can regulate uh, the immune system that is well beyond canonical when signaling, although that's all also always very important in tissue repair. The DKK2, I think, finally gets to looking at a question that I've always been really curious about, which is the regulation of proliferation versus differentiation of stem cells. We currently have in progress uh, some um, mutant AKP organoids, and we can try to knock those out with uh, a DKK2 CRISPR uh, lentivirus vector. And there are other, way, other um, experiments involving um, analysis of NK cells and MDSCs. This is just a summary of our uh, PDX models that we have developed. Um, 
The number of parentheses indicates the number of individual models that we have. We have a fair amount on, ongoing in breast cancer, uh, in head and neck cancer, melanoma. We're trying to develop that with CRC given our strong interest in um, the uh, intestinal tumor genesis. Uh, we have some fascinating stuff in lung cancer and we're trying to get some um, uh, models going with glioblastoma uh, with Tony and Joe. We were fortunate enough to put out a paper at the beginning of 2016, which preceded a remarkable year in which so many different publications came out showing the role of DKK in so many different processes. Hematopoietic stem cells, memory structure, resident memory cells, um, and it, it's truly remarkable. Um, so I just acknowledge the people who have uh, done the work. We have a lot of collaborators. Um, Eddie Che has been the driver of the DKK1 work. Asha is the uh, <coughs> STAT6 work and the MBSC work. Che Hoon Shin is doing the DKK2 work. And Steve Marr is doing the uh, PDX models. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You know, I think because we're running a little late, I think we'll uh, we'll let folks ask questions uh, to Al privately and turn to our next speaker. Oh, sorry. So, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Val Kluger, and uh, Yuval is an associate professor of pathology and a member of our Cancer Center's genetics, genomics, and epigenetics research program. Uh, his work has really been in developing. Uh, novel approaches to data science, and uh, we'll hear today about approaches for single cell analysis. So thanks. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk in this forum. Um, uh, I don't know if I have enough time to go through all the things. I had the menu with two, two uh, courses, uh, tapas and the uh, main course, and now probably it would be fast food, I don't know. Uh, so in the first part, I will talk to you about dimensional reduction method, how we can do fast dimensional reduction method like principal component analysis, diffusion maps, PCA that are very important in order to compress data from high throughput experiments. In the second part, I will talk about issues that arise in high throughput experiments of calibration. So how to remove batch effects in experiments of this type. So my interest in this topic of single cell technology started a few years ago when we actually analyzed bulk data from exome sequencing and from copy number variations. And the idea was to take bulk experiments from millions of cells and try to infer the underlying structure of subpopulation for cells of clones and subclones in the data. Now, mathematically speaking, it's an impossible task because there are infinite number of solutions to this problem. So we imposed biologically motivated constraints on the system, like that the system is evolutionary or for instance, a particular mutation arises only in one event during the evolution. And with this type of constraints, we reduce the number of solutions dramatically and sometimes to unique solutions. And what you see on the right-hand side is we run our algorithm trap on three melanoma samples from the same patients in three different sites. And there is commonality between those trees in the different sites. Now, the problem with this approach is that you have to validate it somehow. And the only way to validate it is to do single cell experiments. However, unfortunately, current uh, single cell experiments in DNA sequencing, exome sequencing, are still Im immature and they have lots of noise. And if you take many single cell and you take the average, it doesn't agree with the bulk measurement that's supposed to be the average. So the technology that is working these days and it's very popular is single cell uh, RNA sequencing. And many people are using it. At Yale, we have the 10x genomics uh, uh, platform and as well as the DropSeq platform. And there are many other platforms of single cell analysis. And there are lots of computational uh, <coughs> challenges there. Normalization, noise reduction. The thing that is most interesting for the crowd here is how to identify uh, subpopulations of cells and how to identify genes that differentiate between the different subpopulations. Some people are also interested in questions of what are the genes that are differentially behave be between sample before treatment and after treatment. And there are people that are trying to take this type of static data and infer also 
uh, dynamical information like cell cycle phase or reconstruction of lineage branching. The biggest problem with this type of data is that it's mostly zeros, and that's the reason for the title there, learning, learning from nothingness. And this is an example of data from a 10X company, and they actually uh, sequenced 68,000 uh, PBMCs, and they selected 1,000 genes that are the most variable genes. And as, as you can see here, most of this matrix is empty. These are the zeros. So how can we make sense out of those uh, matrices that we get in this type of experiments? So principal component analysis that many of you heard about is actually the Swiss Army knife of analysis of big data. And because there are structures in the data, there are relationships between the genes, when you do principal component analysis that I will explain in a moment what it is, you compress the data to much lower dimension and you utilize the correlations between the genes and the data. So what is principal component analysis? Look here on the right hand side. Oops. Look here on the right hand side. You see the data. Let's say that we have only three genes, M1, M2, and M3. And you try to encapsulate the data in ellipsoid that capture all the data. And uh, what are the principal components? is a simple rotation of the uh, blue axis to the red axis, such that the first principal component is the first principal component is in the direction of the largest variation. The second one is the second largest variation and orthogonal to the first, and so on. If you have 20,000 genes, 20,000 genes, and you do principal component analysis, the, the, the small, the, you don't need to invent. If you have 22,000 genes, um, when you do principal component analysis, you don't have to retain all the 22,000 principal components. You retain only principal components whose variation is large enough, like the first principal component is the largest variation and so forth. So in the typical RNA sequencing experiments, you have to retain about 30 to 60 principal components that are above the noise level of the data of the experiments, okay? Now, in single cell RNA sequencing and GWA studies or future GWA studies, the matrices become so large that you cannot calculate the principal component analysis. So luckily enough, there was a person in my lab that was first a professor of mathematics at NYU and then he moved to my lab and now he's the lead the, um, mathematician in Facebook. And with him, we implemented ideas that he developed in the past, implementation of past principal component analysis in C, in R, in many uh, di uh, different platforms. And not only that, a few months ago, we also developed approaches to do these calculations out of code, which means that you don't have to load the matrix into your computer that is limited in memory, and you can do the, experiment, the, the calculation by reading one row at a time from the matrix. And this is very important in future experiments and uh, experiments that I'll show you in the future here in this talk. And this is the algorithm that was published uh, just a year ago. <clears throat> okay, so you have the principal components. What people want to do with this, they compress the data, fine. It rem remove also the noise. But you want also to visualize, to see what are the clusters, what are the subpopulations of cells that you have in the data. So imagine that you could live in high dimension and you have all these uh, cells up there. And maybe there are clusters, but you cannot see it. It's very high dimension. If you use principal component analysis and project it only the, to the first living principal components, one and two and three, what will happen, you'll have clutter of many, many clusters together and you'll not be able to visualize it, okay? So you'll have a clutter. So people realized a few years ago that in order to see something, you can do the following thing. Imagine that he, this is your uh, data. You have the genes and you have the different uh, cells. The, each, one, each column here is a single cell. And you can measure distances between the cells. Now, it doesn't make sense to measure the distance between a T cell and brain cell and all those T cells and liver cell. The distances are so large that it, it's meaningless. What is meaningful is to measure small distances and retain local relationship between similar cells or similar samples. And that's exactly what can be done in very simple transformation that is shown to you here. Here I have the distances between all the experiments all pairs of experiments, but what we can do here, we put it in an inverse function of the distance. It's an exponentially decaying function of the distance. So if two cells, xi and xj, are similar, the distance is almost zero, an exponent of zero is one. So the probability that they are coming from, uh, or the affinity of the probability that they are coming from the same cell type is very high. 
Whereas if the distance between them is a little bit big, it decays very quickly and this probability becomes zero. So let me demonstrate it here on the right hand side. Imagine that you have data with two genes, X1 and X2, and here you have two uh, subpopulations of cells that are connected with the bridge here. Now, the cells, the red cells here are farther away from each other than the distance between these red cells and these yellow cells. However, if you use this trick of looking at through things only by looking at similarity of nearest neighbors, the number of trajectories to go from this point to this point is gigantic. There are many uh, nearest neighbors to this uh, red cell because it's in the cluster, whereas the number of trajectories to go from this red cell to yellow cell is much smaller. So to diffuse from here to here, it's much easier than to diffuse from here to here. So if we take this object and look at the principal components of this object instead of this object, we get a new representation, the principal component of this object, and it's called sometimes a spectral embedding and diffusion maps. And you see that all the cells from here are clustered here, all the cells from here are clustered here, and here you have few cells in the bridge in between. So you manage to stretch things away and start to see some kind of structure in the data. However, even with this type of transformation, it's still difficult to see in two dimensions. Now, recently, uh, we, we developed a very clear, a clever algorithm to compute it very fast. If you see this uh, distance matrix here, and you have million cells, the number of computation is million squared here. And it's very large. You cannot put it in your computer. So we developed a deep learning approach to calculate it very fast. And we also learn what is the correct distance matrix to put there. But I'm not going to talk about that. Now, 10 or 12 years ago, uh, Van der Matten and Hinton <coughs> invented a very clever algorithm to visualize the data in two dimensions. It's called uh, TSNE for T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. The idea is the following. These are the distances between the cells in the high dimension. You cannot visualize it. And you want to retain the local relationship between them, such that these two will be close to each other and these all five will be close to each other. So the idea is put the same number of points in two dimensions randomly, and then ask that the uh, uh, probability that two things are close to each other in uh, high dimension are also close to each other in low dimension. But the idea is to make, uh, use another distribution, not the exponentially decaying one, but one that decays much slower. And this allows you actually to spread all those clusters that if you just project them to a lower dimension, you spread them all over to all directions in two dimensions of space, and then you'll be able to see something. So how do you do that? What we want is that this distribution and this distribution will be as similar as possible. We want to minimize the divergence between the two. And there are mathematical ways how to do that. It's called the kullback leibler distance. And after you minimize uh, the distance between them, what minimization means is to take a derivative of this object and to go down from your initial state of how the y's are distributed and they start to move in the two dimensions until they reach some equilibrium or minimum. And once you finish, you get the result. And here is an example of taking these 68,000 uh, 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 PBMCs projected in two leading uh, TSNE uh, variables. And these are the maps that you see in many of the pap uh, modern paper that are analyzing uh, single cell analysis. <coughs> now, what is our contribution to all this? A year ago, the company uh, 10x Genomics uh, published on online uh, data from 1.3 million brain cells that they studied. And they tried to do TSNE. They couldn't do that because it's too big for them. So what they did, they took a subsample and they projected it. Do they miss something? Probably yes. They are not using all the information. <coughs> okay? Not only that, you'll see that they can miss some of the biology by ignoring all the data that they have. So bear with me. I'm not going into the mathematics. Uh, the idea that I told you is that uh, uh, we want to minimize the divergence between the high dimensional distribution and the low dimensional distribution that is encapsulated in this mathematical formula. And we have to update the location of the y's in step t to step t uh, plus one by taking some derivative to go towards the minimum of the solution to find the minimum distance between these two distributions. The derivative of this or the gradient of this is expressed here in these two terms. And it's like forces. What you have is many cells. Each cell, uh, uh, I is a cell, J is a cell. Here you have an attraction force, and here you have a repulsion force. Okay. Now, luckily, the attraction force can be calculated quite quickly. If you have n cells in the data, this 
pij in the high dimension decays very quickly. It's exponential. And there are tricks from computer science that call k nearest neighbors approaches that allow you to calculate this object in n log n, n times log n uh, step, uh, time. Okay, that's the complexity of the program. However, the second term, the repulsion term, is proportional to n squared. You have million cells, it takes million squared in each step calculation. It's gigantic, you cannot do that. So uh, knowing uh, some of the mathematicians in Yale University that invented in the 80s a very important algorithm for the nth body problem, um, I contacted them and we started to work on this problem in, uh, using the following trick. I'm not going into the mathematics, it's too complicated. Imagine that you have here all these cells and each cell is interacting with each other cell. So if this cell, this cell is interacting with other n cells and these cells with the other n cells, so you have n squared computation, impossible. Okay, so what do we do? Imagine that we put on, the, on, on this uh, space a grid of, let's call them post offices, okay? So each, each person, if he wants to send a, a letter to a particular city, goes to that city, puts the letter here. And then a person also uh, sits here in this, uh, at home and he's getting all the letters from the post offices. Each of those calculations is n times the number of post offices. It's much smaller uh, computation than the computation that is needed to be done directly. So uh, with this, with this uh, I can show you the result in terms of the speed. These are the current uh, approaches. And this is our approach. And you can see that if you have million cells, it's about uh, one order of magnitude faster than existing algorithms. So let's go to the results of this part of the talk. Uh, here on the right-hand side, I'm showing you uh, results from analyzing the TS and ETH map using all the 1.3 million cells. And what you can see here, we find that there is a separate cluster here. And we ask ourselves, what are the genes that are highly expressed in this cluster? It turns out that these genes are these, and these are genes that are known to be unique for erythroblasts, okay? If you do the analysis using the subsample of these cells, only 20,000 cells, look what happened to the erythroblasts. They split here into two clusters. So by poor biologists that analyze this data will say, wow, I discovered a new set of, of, of uh, erythrocytes, right? And if you are really interested in some rare populations, if you use only a subset of the cells, you're going to miss it. So it's important to analyze the data with all the information that you have. Another trick that John, George Liederman, a, a MD PhD student in my lab that is doing his PhD in mathematics, he noticed that if you increase the attraction term towards the end of the calculation a bit, the, the standard TSNE solution becomes much clearer to your eye. You can see clearly the separation between uh, the different uh, uh, points that you are analyzing. One more advantage of the approach that we uh, develop, we realize that if we project the data to two dimensions or one dimension, we get very similar results. So from data from 50,000 retinal cells from this paper, this is the TSNE map uh, in two dimensions. And we realize that same partitioning you have uh, achieved also by projection to one dimension. What is the advantage of that? You can organize simultaneously both the partitioning of the cell and the genes that are expressed. So you have a heat map automatically with this type of approach. So let me switch gears now to the second topic. Um, <clears throat> I'll talk about how to remove batch effects in high uh, throughput data, in particular mass cytometry and single cell RNA sequencing. So on the left side, you see data that I took from Hadith Radassi from the Hafler lab of an MS patient. And this blood sample was measured twice in two different batches. And you can see very big difference between the two batches. Similar situation appears in this data that we took from study on bipolar cells uh, of mass retina. And you can see big differences between uh, the two um, samples. So what people usually do, they do very simple-minded type of calibration or removal of batch effects by standardization of each marker at the time. So if you have 22,000 genes, you have to do the for each gene separately. However, this approach is not very good because it doesn't take into account the correlations between the genes. So there are methods that are multivariate, like PCA or COMBAT, that are trying to do that. However, they are linear and they cannot do that properly. They remove some of the batch effects, but uh, there is a substantial part of the batch effects still remaining after these procedures. So we develop a deep learning approach to do a nonlinear multivariate calibration. 
Now, what is deep learning? So, um, so I'll try to explain it <laughs> in a slide in two or three minutes, and uh, I hope that it will be clear. So let's start with shallow learning. This is neural network with only one hidden layer. You have two variables here, x1 and x2, and you take the inputs from these two nodes in, to each node or neuron in the hidden layer, and each, uh, they are combined with different weights, w22, w12, so you take a weighted average of these two variables, you add a constant, and eventually you add also some nonlinear transformation of the data. Let's say that if the sum is greater than zero, you leave this result as is, and if the sum is negative, you transform it or set it to zero. So this is a non-linear transformation. And this is true for every node. It gets a different linear combination. And you can then do the same trick going from this layer to the next layer, okay? You can do the same thing with more layers. And it's not clear how many layers you have to ha put and how many nodes or neurons you have to put in each layer. There is no theory for that. The only theory that exists today in neural network is something that was proved at Yale University by Andrew Barron from the statistics department uh, about in the 80s or 90s, that every continuous function can be approximated very well by neural network. If, if, if you need to make it more approx uh, uh, better, you add more nodes to the, the network. But it's not clear why adding more layers helps. But it helps, especially in imaging, speech recognition, and natural language processing. So let me tell you how it works. Imagine that you have three variables, x1, x2, <coughs> x3. This is your input, and you try to predict some variable y, OK? So you do the tricks, as I told you, with all these weights here. And you get some output. The network spits some output. And what you want is that the output will agree with what you want to predict. So you want that the predictions and what you want to predict will be as similar as possible. So you take this difference between them. Let's call it the cost function and you try to minimize it. When you minimize it, you have to calculate some gradients or deri derivatives to find the, mi uh, the minimum. And when you do that, you propagate back information to the network how to change the weights such that uh, it will, be, uh, it will come to a minimum that the cost function will be almost zero. So now when you take test cases to the system, it can predict correctly uh, what you want to predict. Now, deep learning is good if you have large sample size. And I realized that in RNA sequencing, in single cell RNA sequencing and site of experiments, there are lots of cells. You can measure hundreds of thousands of million cells and then deep learning becomes useful. But if you have small sample size and you have more variables than samples like in traditional microarray experiments or RNA-seq experiments, there is no need to use deep learning. Now, deep learning can be used also in different co uh, contexts, not only supervised learning, not just pr to predict something. In this case, I show you something they call autoencoder. You have input and you have output. And what you try to minimize is that the output and the input will be the same. You try to minimize the difference between the input and the output. When you do that, you get internally some nodes that are capturing very interesting features of the data uh, that you are studying. And these are actually embedding in nonlinear fashion. It's like principal components, but nonlinear principal components, in, in a sense. And they are very, very powerful in understanding and finding automatically patterns in, in data. If you take images, you can find automatically noses and eyes and things like that automatically without in, your intervention and using labels and anything. OK, so now we have this uh, deep learning uh, knowledge. So let's move on. Uh, the goal of the calibration or the batch effect removal is to put the red distribution on top of the blue distribution. So what we did, we created a neural network that has uh, measures distances between distribution and we try to minimize this, this, uh, this measure. This measure is very useful for high dimensionality. So we did this, but then we realized that we have a little problem. Um, we got good results, but not good enough. There were cases where we have the following problem. Let's take this uh, uh, example that you have CD4 cells and CD8 cells. And what you want to do when you calibrate this batch to this batch, that these guys will go here and these guys will go here. Unfortunately, if you do naive deep learning the way I told you, what will happen is that the small cluster will go to the small cluster and the big cluster to the big cluster. Not good. So what we did, we realized that two years ago there was an interesting publication by Microsoft in image uh, uh, analysis competition. And what they did, they had 255 layers. 
and they did shortcuts every few layers. Now we decided let's use this uh, shortcut uh, um, trick, but for completely different reason, not their reason. They, they, for them, it improved their um, performance. What we did, we by doing this uh, shortcut, we force the input and the output to be slightly deformed. So if x is the input, the output will be x plus a little bit thing here. So this doesn't allow these guys to move so much in space. So they will go if they move a little bit to to this region. Okay, so that was the idea of the shortcut. Uh, another element of deep learning that we used, I told you about autoencoders, but uh, there is something called denoising autoencoder. And what we've, di we've done here, we uh, took the input data of cells that were measured properly. Many cells in se site of experiments, or in single cell or RNA sequencing, are highly corrupted. So we took only a subset that is not corrupted, we corrupted it by hand. Okay, and now we require that the output and the input that is not corrupted are minimized. And this difference is minimized. Once the system is trained, you can take also corrupted cells and get a, a good representation of the corrupted cells over here. Here is an example. This is the data. It was corrupted, and after using the network, it gives you images like that. The same thing we did for the data from site of experiments. So here are the results. What you see here are uh, two um, graphs here. On the left side is data before the calibration, as I showed you before, and that's what happened after we calibrated it. Here I show you one marker at a time. You see that the, green, uh, the, the red and the blue are the two batches, and we learn how to map the, the red to the blue, and it becomes the green. So they are very, very close to each other. Okay, uh, <clears throat> this is another example in which we use uh, RNA sequencing. This is before the calibration and after the calibration. Um, we use the deep learning on, not only for calibration issues, but also for gating. When people do flow cytometry or mass cytometry, they have to uh, separate the cells to different subpopulations of T cells, for instance, and B cells, and natural killer cells, and monocytes, etc. So we build a neural network to do these predictions by taking only one sample with the labels. We train it to find uh, the correct uh, predictions, and then we can apply it to all the rest of the samples that we have in the study. And we compared what we did uh, here in, two, in four different diseases, including cancer, to the winners of competition that was done a few uh, years ago. Uh, these are the best algorithms that were, uh, they had at that time, and we performed better than them. And this is an example from uh, data from Ruth uh, Montgomery lab, and these are two batches of measuring a, a blood sample from a patient in two different instruments in two different institutions. And you see that uh, the CD4 cells are actually not clustered together. And it says the same is true to all the rest. But after we use our calibration together with uh, this type of approach, everything sits in the right place in space. Okay, so um, I don't know if I have time uh, to talk about the future. Uh, I, I just mentioned in a couple of words. Uh, the real goal that we have is to be able to do large-scale experiments in which we do, we have a reference uh, sample, let's call it patient one, and we calibrate patient one to patient one. We take the, 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 the pink to the red, and once we do that, we have a network. And the goal is use this network to be able also to take the light blue and calibrate it to the dark blue. However, this is very problematic mathematically because we learned how to take this domain and map it to the red domain. But the blue dots here that out of the pink domain, they, they don't know where to move exactly. So my practical solution for that is that in large scale, scale experiments, what people should probably do to take a pool of many cells from many patients, all the patients in the study from all the different batches and different institutions, mix them all together such that the reference sample that you use in each batch will be inclusive, a superset. And then you'll be able to do the transformation from the pink to the red and use it for all the other patients and move them to one coordinate system in which you can really learn about differences between people and what is the effect of a drug. Otherwise, you have lots of variation and it leads to errors in the inference. Just to make sure that to, to, to convince you that it makes sense what I'm suggesting here. Here, this is data, again, from Hadir from the Afro lab, two uh, MS patients before and after treatment. 
and in two batches. So all these samples are from batch two, all these samples from batch one. We just cluster them based on the data. And you see that the separation is based on the batch, not based on the patient, not based on the treatment. When we map batch two to batch one, what you see on the right hand side is that uh, the, separ the biggest separation is based on the treatment. The next largest separation is between patients and there is a little residual of batch effects remaining after our training. Okay, so I think we can finish here. And uh, just to mention to you that now we are in the gold uh, rush of single cell analysis. Everybody is excited about this. Many people are, want to do that. I see it a lot. I'm in the uh, CBD study section, the cancer uh, biomarker study section. Now, what, I see lots of application using it. And the person that made most money in the gold rush is not the person that looked for the gold, but this person that actually came up with this idea of the genes, right? Levi's. And, um, right? So at the moment in our age, the people that make most money out of this are the technology companies and also people like me that are producing the algorithms. And we, because you want cool stuff, we sell you cool stuff. But we have to be a little bit uh, cautious because uh, we sell you cool stuff with lots of holes also. And you have to be very, very careful how to analyze, interpret the data. And there are lots of tricks in analyzing data of this type with the many holes that I showed you before. So I would like to thank people in my lab in the first row. Uh, George Linderman and these three young mathematicians in the math department, together we developed the Tisney approach with Uri Shaham and uh, Kelly Stanton and Kwamin Lee and June, we uh, developed the calibration and uh, the um, site of uh, uh, gating approach. And with Uri Shaham, Kelly, and these two gentlemen from the Weizmann Institute, we have the fast uh, diffusion maps or nonlinear embedding approach. And with Mark Tiger, Kelly, George, and Kwamin, we developed the fast PCA approaches. So the rest of the people in this uh, slide are people that we collaborate and get lots of advice. And we collaborate also with people that are doing the uh, single cell analysis with Sherman Weissman and Richard Flaubert. Thank you very much. So, uh, you know what, we are, we're about 10 minutes late. Two very stimulating talks, but I'll let individuals approach our speakers.